please welcome Stefan Bogner and Deandra Forrest to the stage for our next conversation, The Future is Inclusive. Good morning, everyone. You have another Canadian here um, <laughs> from Montreal. I actually, uh, I know you love Canadians because when I arrived last night, I just saw at the airport, Canadian dollar accepted at par. So I was like, oh, they welcome us. And um, I'll start this conversation by, you know, I'm a Canadian, but I'm also, I have a green card. So I feel very, very North American. <laughs> um, it's always a privilege to share a stage with uh, my, I can actually now see my friend, Deandra Forrest, um, a fellow New Yorker. Uh, it's a real privilege, Deandra, to see you again here. Um, we were asked to talk about what we're currently doing, our, our new colorful campaign. But let's backtrack and say, what is inclusivity? What, what does inclusivity mean? The, the yous, them, us, the we's. How do we build a community of we's, right? How do you sing it? dance it, how do you sit around a communal space, or last night, for some of you who were downtown, if you heard the honking, um, the protests, how do we all sit, stand around a communal space, our space, and just belong, just belong? How do you, how do you feel valued? A couple months ago, I gave a lecture at Columbia University on inclusivity, and I made reference. I brought up two children's authors, Hugh Lofting, the famous British author who wrote Dr. Doolittle, and Monroe Leaf, an American author who wrote How to Behave in the Story of Ferdinand. Classic authors who wrote timeless messages on inclusivity. Inclusivity is not really difficult to understand, but today it is full of political, economic, social, cultural connotations. And I always say, if you need help, go to children's books. They're great, wonderful guides. But to understand inclusion, let's look at exclusion, right? Let's say exclusion, or as the French politician, uh, France Lenoir wrote, René Lenoir wrote, les exclus. Have you ever been pushed aside, ignored, or today there's a term called ghosted, right? Have you been ghosted? And let's go one step further. Have you been refused entry into a school, to a health center, to any sort of activity, to a party? Or what happens when you're invited to a party where you think it's a party, but actually, you're there because you will be killed. Exclusion. It is one of the most painful hurts that anyone can experience. Not belonging to a, to a family or to a community it destroys the me inside. It destroys the you. It destroys your spirit. Every day you're filled with, with anxiety and stress. And, and last night, honking till about 1 a.m., the anger, the anger of not being included. There are days when you're, you're looking for these children books, which I cherish, because you have to find the cracks of happiness, the cracks of hope, in this wall of hatred, this, or these walls of anger, or these walls of exclusion? Come on, at the end of the day, we all want to feel valued. We all want to feel like we belong. We all want our differences to be respected. Inclusion real inclusion. And when you put these two words together, when you combine them, real inclusion, it feels wonderful, feels right. 
Why? Because we want to feel part of something real, not an illusion or not a dream. But for some, as we will discuss, inclusion is just a dream. One author, Brene Brown, wrote in her book that even for some, dreaming is not even possible. They are, they are too injured, too hungry, to even dream, to even, to even dream. Inclusion. Sense of belonging. Valued. As I frame this, I want to talk to you this morning with Deandra about albinism. Growing up in the 70s, I think we refer to albinism as albinos, right? I think today we're still using this. And believe it or not, albinism comes from albus, which is Latin for white. What does that really mean? Since 2006, there have been over 700 attacks and violations against persons with albinism. And these are just the cases reported. We don't know what's going on in the rural, isolated communities. In Malawi, since 2014, there have been over 160 attacks and 22 murders. The NYGG Foundation, we have a program in Rwanda. And we get weekly updates on some of the atrocities that take place in Africa. Imagine being a mother worried about your child going to school and maybe not coming back because your child has been skinned. Or a little girl a few weeks ago dismembered because of the color of their skin. Because how some people think they have magical powers and look at them as good luck charms. That is their reality today as we sit on the stage. Think about inclusion. It's a hard times for some of us. And that's why it's a privilege to share this page with Deandra Forrest, a real local hero. The foundation, NYG Foundation, started colorful last year to change this reality. It's, we're, we're really excited to launch one of the largest multimedia campaigns on albinism, on human rights, called Colorful, My Albinism, My Color. And I have to say, we are sharing this space with wonderful NGOs have built some wonderful programs across Africa. We're not alone in this space. My Albinism, My Color is all about inclusivity. It's about finding also new ambassadors, advocates and allies who can help us fight for the rights of persons with albinism. And this is where we found Deandra Forrest, a native of New York. Deandra? Yes. Great to see you, as always. It's always great to be here with you. <laughs> and sharing our space. What was it like growing up in New York City with albinism in the 90s? What were the greatest challenges that you experienced? Well, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, in a household with my two brothers, my sister, my mom and dad, and we were a very close-knit family, full of love and support and unity. And I was actually really shocked and devastated when I was thrown into a public school system which um, did not understand my albinism. I was actually constantly teased, called Casper, which was a friendly ghost, for those who you know, of know, and um, Snow White, and Powder, which today doesn't sound like harsh names at all, but these names were to discriminate and to make me feel less than because I have white skin. And that alongside being with teachers who did not understand how to accommodate my visual needs. For those of you who don't know, most people with albinism have visual impairments, so we need things like larger print, and I couldn't see the blackboard. 
and it was always told to me just to copy my peers' notes. But I had albinism, no one really wanted to come near me, so I couldn't copy anyone's notes. And it was pretty hard for me to learn. So with the, with the discrimination and not having the needs met, it was a hard time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Discrimination, bullying in school. But you did have a family where you felt valued and you felt belong. You felt like you belonged. And you gave you that safe space. Absolutely. So how did you become the person today, the DeAndre Forrest? By having that safe space, by having my family and being able to go home and know that it, I was in a judgment-free zone. And eventually, I did move to another school, which was a school for people with blindness and visual impairments. And they had all of the accommodations for me, so I could really thrive and feel comfortable and be excited about learning. And I also started um, running track and swimming and cheerleading and having that team, that unity, that family. And we were working toward accomplishing a goal and just that support was, meant the world to me. Finding that right space in the school where kids spend eight hours a day, mm -hmm. understanding where, where we have kids in Rwanda with our, our skin deep scholarships and where teachers really don't understand how to deal with kids with albinism. Um, everything from not closing the shades because it's too bright um, or writing on a blackboard, they can't see it. Um, we're really seeing the difficulties when, when you don't work with teachers and principals in the school system, in public school system. But you found, again, a great, your parents supported you and understood your needs and brought you to the right space for you to grow and evolve. Yeah, definitely. Which, which again, is, is so key. And when we launched Colorful, and again, I have a great team. We have a great team. They're not here today. Everyone from Stephanie Sinclair, I'm not sure if you saw some of these photos, if we're able to put some of the photos. Incredible photographs on our Colorful campaign. Are they, Tria, are we able to have these photos up? Oh, do you see them somewhere? We have an incredible team. Like I was saying, Stephanie Sinclair from National Geographic, Thad Cox, Naz Nasli, Anne O'Malley, who put this together. Um, where I'm going to the next topic on, when we found DeAndre through the, the fashion world, the, through the page of the fashion, um, as we all know, beauty is dictated by the fashion industry and inclusivity. What was it like, DeAndre? Again, today when you look and you Google albinism, models, your name comes up. What was it like, though, when you joined this fashion industry? How inclusive was it? What was it like working with these brands? Fashion wasn't as nearly as inclusive as it is today. I started modeling 10 years ago, and there weren't many people with albinism shown in a positive light. Albinism was not seen as beautiful, and I knew that that's something I wanted to change. I felt, and still feel, of course, that representation is so important, inclusivity is so important, but these brands didn't know how to market me, someone who didn't fit into the societal beauty norms, and what does that even mean? You know, we're all different, but we're all beautiful, and we should all feel comfortable in, with sharing that and showing that to the world. So I, I believe that just having people, figures that look different is so important to, to shine that light on and onto the world. And it decreases bullying and increases confidence and awareness. So you think today the fashion industry really embraces um, inclusivity and diversity, respecting differences and embracing you? Today, we, I know we have Connie Chu, Thando Hopa, Sean Ross. So do you think they've really broken the ceiling? Absolutely. I think that having these public figures that have albinism, I, I know I get inboxes every day of people just feeling way more confident and happy about their albinism and even more comfortable about expressing what albinism is because now people know about it more. It's in the media and it's shown to be beautiful. Yeah, and I remember uh, a few months ago where you bumped into this little girl at the shopping mall and she was just in awe and so inspired by who you were. You're right, a role model for, for the next generation, yeah. inspiring them. And that's what we're trying to do with Colorful, My Alm is My Color, is to inspire, to, to change behavior, right? To inspire a new generation to really embrace inclusivity and to embrace differences and really feel valued and that we, we all belong. 
Um, and colorful, my albums and my color, what does that mean for you, Deandra? When you joined our campaign, we wanted Deandra to be one of the leading global ambassadors for a colorful campaign. What does that really mean for you, colorful? The Colorful Campaign has given me a strong platform to be able to celebrate my albinism. I am a model, I'm a mother, I'm an actress and an activist, and those are all colorful parts of my life. Just because I have white skin or a lack of color doesn't equal a life without color. And it also gives me a platform to help inspire other people with albinism so they can also feel, feel included and feel amazing. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to celebrate. And if you saw how we spelled colorful, colorful, two L's, a life full of color. We want to celebrate a life full of color with unconditional support. And today, when we talk about building healthier and more inclusive communities, what does that mean to you, healthier, more inclusive community, with, with the community, with albinism? Well, healthier. People with albumin actually have the highest risk of skin cancer around the world. And sunblock is very expensive in most countries, and it's not even accessible to people with albinism. So governments should be putting in place programs to get people with albinism the skin protection that they need. You're absolutely right. Um, Dr. David Colbert, the, the founder, the co-founder of NYDG, we've launched some teledermatology clinics in Rwanda, right from our office in New York. And what we saw is, is astonishing. It's, uh, it's quite sad. Um, life expectancy in some of these countries, because of skin cancer, is 40 years of age. 40 years of age, all because of the sun. So if you're not poached for your body parts, you're actually killed by the sun. And like Deandre was saying, sunblock. Who can afford $13 for a bottle of sunblock? Who can afford that? What middle-income family, poor person, can afford that? And talking about treatment, do you know that in Africa, there's approximately one dermatologist for every two million citizens? So prevention and treatment, non-existent. So when we talk about building healthier societies, especially with this community, we are looking at how we could build up dermatology, how we can do more prevention and more treatment, and of course, inclusivity, bringing the governments on board so that they can open up the economy, vocational training, schooling is so, so important. We still have all the statistics on how many, how many kids have actually dropped out of school because they're bullied, actually extremely bullied, extremely discriminated against, or just can't see. And I said, that is their reality. And Deandra, I mean, you've met some wonderful people. You've traveled around the globe. Um, one of the most inspiring things that you've heard and what would you like to share with the audience? The best advice that you received and can share with the audience? The word different comes up a lot, and I think people shouldn't shy away from the word, word different. I think everyone is different, and we should embrace our differences. And be, feel comfortable with showing that to the world because you, you don't know where it will take you and you never know who you can help by just being you, being different, loving who you are. Being unique mm -hmm. and having that safe space around the table, a space that's for you, that you feel like you belong. Absolutely. I, I agree, and that's what Colorful, like I was saying, is really all about, and that's why I like to, to challenge everyone here to to really practice your inclusivity skills, moving closer to an inclusive society. You know, since 1995, with the Copenhagen Declaration, and now the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, where it's all about healthy human development, we have no more excuses. We really gotta start tearing down these walls of exclusion, these walls of anger. It's time to start to really renewing if we can say renewing our commitment to social justice and inclusion, there should not be a membership card or membership cost to join an inclusive society. Belonging should, should really not be a reward, right? 
So I really do encourage everyone here today, a challenge of you today to really practice your inclusivity skills and let's color, let's color this world together. Thank you. I was, we are gonna open up for questions. I was given the, the iPad. Um, should we start with questions in the room? Or go straight to the iPad? Any questions on albinism or what we're doing inclusivity, our colorful campaign? There was a question here. Is there an international conversation happening on this topic within the, who might the global allies be? Yes, there are international conversations happening. A couple of years ago, the United Nations appointed a special rapporteur for albinism, the first time ever. So now they have an appointed, we wanna say ambassador, that deals with these issues. On a global scale, there's also a regional action plan for Africa, making leaders accountable for what's going on so there are some incredible comprehensive action plans on how to deal, how to work, and how to bring persons down back into the economy, back onto the social agenda. So there are many conversations, and some great NGOs, Human Rights Organization, Open Society, uh, Under the Same Sun. You have some leading organizations and NGOs working in this field. We're just very happy to build on the work that they've done. Our program is going from, so we launched in New York City on June 13th, we're off to LA, then after LA, we're going to Hong Kong, Johannesburg, London, Berlin, Moscow, Buenos Aires, and back to New York. It is a real 365 degree campaign, not just celebrating albums once a year on June 13th. You can't just celebrate it once a year. Because of that, we only look at albinism as a disability. We have to celebrate the full life of a person, the full color of a person. Yes. So this question is for Deandra. So Deandra, we're in a period right now where identity is an important element of politics. And so I'm curious to know how you think about identity. I think identity really it's it makes it's who you are you know whoever you identify as you should feel comfortable with expressing that and i think we shouldn't judge you know who is to say who someone should be what they should look like who they should love i think we are all different and we should that that's no one's place to judge that another question here says um it's a good one when I compare global challenges of basic existence, like resource constraint, food, sanitation, healthcare, et cetera, to challenges of inclusion in man-made social structures, I am conflicted about what should our governments prioritize. The ideal answer is both, but practically that's different. What do you think? Inclusion is not an option. Inclusion is not a privilege. It just is. I understand that, you know, it's interesting. When we're excluding a community from participating, maybe we're actually excluded the right answer. We're, we're pushing aside a group that may be able to help solve our global issues, but they're not invited to the table. So we're missing out on all these solutions, potential solutions, these answers to global, local, regional problems. So inclusion is part of the answer to solving these global issues. It really isn't an option. It's a necessity. It really is. The, um, to Deandra, describe the changes in inclusion you've seen since your youth in modeling, et cetera, TV, are they there yet? How can media, entertainment, improve on inclusion? And how can we as consumers, here's a good one, demand inclusivity? 
That is a good question. Um, we have took many steps forward. I think we're headed in the right direction. We have models like Sean Ross, who also has Dalvinism, Winnie Harlow, who has vitiligo, and just there are there is such a vast, diverse set of models now, and it's so important to have that because I think if I would have had that representation when I was younger, it would have made life a lot easier. Um, and I think as a consumer, I think just to demand having clothing that may, I know um, plus size models have the issue with having clothes that fit their body type or brands not wanting to gear toward women who are a bit curvier. And I think that's a big issue. Um, so I think just not buying these brands that are not inclusive. I think take a stand, put your money where and support brands that are enforcing inclusivity. And as consumers, we can make a choice, right? Don't click, don't buy. Yeah. It's very simple. It really is. We run out of time. There are more questions here. Tria, so I guess we can answer them later on. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Deandra, love working with you as always. Thank you, everyone, very much. <laughs> Cheers.